So good afternoon. The department owes me seven dollars and thirty-three cents for my lift ride because there's no way that you can find a parking place. <laughs> but I have to introduce this guy. <laughs> this guy, huh? All kinds of financial trouble. <laughs> Um, so as you know, uh, uh, DEMA uh, is a for uh, uh, RTP uh, process, and this is uh, a colloquium that's part of that uh, process in the department. Uh, just to remind you, uh, DEMA got his undergraduate uh, degree at the Kiev National University in the Ukraine. Uh, he then went to the University of Colorado to start his graduate work and finally got his PhD at the University of uh, Washington in Seattle in 2009. Uh, he then uh, became a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he left there in 2012. Um, had a brief stay at uh, the postdoc at Caltech in Pasadena, and then since 2012, he has been uh, with us uh, as an assistant professor. Uh, and today, he's going to be telling us about the geometrical theory of non-local transport in metals. Right. Thanks, Peter. So, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, showing up. And uh, this, this title actually does pertain to the uh, most important part of my talk, but given the uh, circumstances, I wanted to uh, give you an overview of things that uh, my group and myself in particular have been concerned with over the uh, past years. So to start with, let me actually introduce the group, which consists of two graduate students, Jing Ma and Jan Vida Ro, and uh, postdoc Junai Chihen. So uh, uh, Jing will graduate soon in, uh, in September, September 20, I think. Uh, I mean, uh, she will have her uh, thesis defense in September uh, 20th. Uh, uh, and then, uh, you know, Janvita will, will go a little bit later in the semester. Okay, so I should also uh, acknowledge a very fruitful collaboration uh, with undergrads at our departments, in particular, uh, together with uh, Oleg, uh, we supervised three RU students over the past uh, couple of summers. Uh, all, all did very well. All of them got uh, various uh, kinds of recognitions, some of the you know, research awards at the research Symposia, uh, Eaton and Caleb uh, got a publication out of their RU work. Uh, maybe the same will happen with Milo. We're still working on some interesting problems in uh, machine learning applications of machine learning to, uh, to phase recognition. Uh, and finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, support of my work coming from uh, a grant uh, through NSF and the uh, University of Utah through startup funds. Okay, so. Uh, let me just uh, outline briefly uh, my research path over the uh, past, I don't know, decade. So before coming here, I was thinking about topological insulators. Then my life took a sharp turn, and I started thinking about topological metals, right? And uh, sort of, uh, I meant it as a half joke, actually, because uh, there, is, there is quite a bit of uh, things different. So if you have been following this area, you will not recognize, you know, many things here, okay? So. Uh, and it, it is essentially this, this area that I will be uh, talking about uh, today. So the guiding principle for today's talk, for the uh, uh, com uh, composition of today's talk, will come from this wonderful uh, uh, question posed by anonymous <coughs> internal referee uh, who noted that it's unclear why topological phases matter to society at all. So actually, you know, I wonder if that, that person meant some uh, 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 wordplay, you know, topological phases of matter, topological phases do not matter, or something like that. So like, <laughs> if, if you're in the audience, wink at me, so I know if, if you meant it. Because I started this internal dialogue with that person long ago, and uh, I will basically continue it uh, throughout this talk. So uh, what I would like to argue is that uh, uh, I don't have an answer for society at large, okay? But uh, they're interesting, these phases are interesting. There are many people interested in them, and uh, most importantly, they can say some, uh, some very uh, cute physics and some absolutely, uh, you know, magical results. So that's what the 
essentially outline for the talk is. And I, I, will, I will do this gradually. So first of all, I will introduce the simple system that uh, got us you know, thinking about uh, these topological metals. But uh, keep in mind that what I'm going to be talking uh, about later in the talk is much more general than this. Okay? So this uh, is a wireless heavy metal. So uh, it sounds fancy, but it's a very, very simple uh, uh, construction. Basically, this is a minimal kind of deviation from the notion of an insulator. Right? In an insulator, one expects a full gap throughout the brilliant zone. Okay? Or if insulator is a fully gapped uh, system, in a wireless metal, one allows a discrete number of bent uh, closures, bent touching throughout the brilliant zone, and demands that these bent touchings are not degenerate, not spin degenerate. Spin degeneracy is lifted either by breaking time reversal or by breaking inversion in the presence of spin orbit coupling. Okay? Very simple. But so. There are always points. Uh, there are points. They're, they're not always points. So uh, there are systems with, with ring, ring uh, touching, but for me, uh, I like points, all right? Okay, so points points are the most stable, if you will. Okay, but you will see that I didn't ever care about points, right? So you you'll see what I care about, right? So the important thing about this uh, system is that is that they they exist, and uh, there are uh, examples of Dirac, so-called Dirac metals, which are basically two copies of this wild metal put on top of each other. So the famous examples uh, is the um, uh, cadmium arsenide and and sodium. Three bismuth. So can you put bismuth any two on top of each other? Or Say it again. Or can you put any two on top of each it, it, other? No, not literally put on top of each other. So it's so this is a structured momentum space. So if if I double the number of these of these uh, bent bent touchings, that's that's what I call a Dirac metal. So they, they are not literally put on top of each other. It's in momentum space. <laughs> so there are examples of wild cell metals. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, zinc pentatellurite. Uh, and then the uh, transition metal nictite family, uh, tantalum arsenide, uh, phosphide, tantalum phosphide, and so on and so forth. So these are you know, known, uh, known bias metals with broken inversion symmetry. Okay? And then statistically, if you take some handbook of all possible you know, uh, crystals uh, out there, it turns out that 25% you know, of them actually have these wild points. It's just in a you know, uh, substantial fraction of those 25%, you know, these wild points are so low, so below the uh, Fermi uh, level that they, they just do not matter. Okay? So there are lots and lots of wild systems, but none of them are seven metals. So in order to pick the right one, you actually have to work. There are much more than this uh, ab initio proposal for these systems, but hopefully this, this not, not exhaustive list is enough to convince you that you know, this is a realistic material. So the first, the first argument that these things matter will be sort of sociological. So, what I'm showing you uh, here is the number of abstracts submitted to APS March meeting. This is the largest U.S. Uh, conference on, sol uh, on condensed matter physics. So, this is the number of abstracts submitted uh, on a particular point. So, for example, let's, uh, let's set the graphene as a reference point. You see here people, people you know, uh, figure out how to use scotch tape properly. So, there is a dramatic growth of, of the number of abstracts submitted. Right, so they, it, it plateaued a few years ago. Now it seems to be going down, actually. So a, this is still a gigantic field, but you see that what the trend is. So uh, with topological insulators, uh, here's what happened. They were essentially introduced by Charlie Kane right after the discovery of, of, of uh, graphene. So they start uh, here. Here there is an experimental discovery of uh, uh, topological insulator based on bismuth uh, daily right? right? The first one. So there is a big cusp, and then you know, growth, and now they actually over to not topological insulators, topological you know materials. If what you is the significance of bismuth telluride? Just just the first, the, just the first material uh, that was identified to be a topological insulator. Right after that, earlier before 2000, I mean, 2006, 2007 was not topological. Is that what you're saying? I mean, bismuth telluride was around, but it, it so wasn't. Paid attention to it. Yeah, exactly. The, the notion was not around. Materials were. So you see this cusp. So with while, uh, with while cell metals or while metals more in general, you see that exactly the same thing is going on. So this is this is the, where they started. Uh, people kind of started discussing them theoretically. So there is a, there is growth actually com very much comparable to growth here. So this is where I gave my you know third year retention whatever it's called talk. 
saying that, look, if there is an experimental discovery, it's going to be like this. Here's an experimental discovery, it's like this. All right, so this prediction worked. Okay, so this, uh, <laughs> this, uh, this, uh, this area actually growing fast. Okay, so there is still a, already a sign of maybe a plateauing or something like that, but who knows what happens, uh, you know, a year from now. Something like that happened with the topological insulators. You know, you see there is sort of plateauing, but then my runner systems are discovered, boom, again, and so on and so forth, okay? So these, these areas, at least they are, uh, they attract a lot of people, which, which is not always a good thing, but at least they matter to someone, okay? So uh, let me then tell you what we have been doing. So this is a list, this is a list of, of uh, works that I'm not going to be talking about today, right? So I just want to mention them so you know they exist, and if you care, maybe we should talk about it. So if you pick any of these, they, it will be either transport or disorder or optics or some collective mode physics in these materials. For example, here we looked at uh, long-range disorder. Uh, here, these are on plasmons in these materials, uh, optical anomalous Hall effect, photogalvanic effect. This, this, uh, this paper I'll actually mention briefly, it's about non-local transport in the systems. So, kind of... I'm not even sure what else can be done about the particular material. That's pretty much it. Okay? So, now uh, I'd like to finally get into what is interesting physically about these materials, okay? Why, why people care. And uh, why people care essentially is contained in these in this couple of words, chiral anomaly, which uh, basically says, tells you that this wild cell metal is the condensed materialization of the high energy. Uh, physics notion of chiral anomaly, which in condensed matter does not really seem like an anomaly at all. It's a very simple thing. So let me tell you what it is and then what kind of consequences it has. Stay here. So to see what it is, uh, is very simple, again, in a crystal. And uh, in order to uh, answer that, uh, uh, to explain to you what, what it is, I need to figure out what the Lando levels are in these materials. So Lando levels uh, essentially represent the spectrum of a system placed in, a, in an external uh, magnetic field, okay? So, without, uh, without magnetic field, a particular, particular wild point is, uh, is essentially uh, described by Hamiltonian that looks like two three-dimensional graphene, right? It's a two bands touching, so they're, they're, it's described by a two by two Hamiltonian mental space, which is just this usual sigma dot p Hamiltonian that you know from any, any two-dimensional wild system. So here, things are three-dimensional, it's important, you'll see why. So without magnetic field, forget about this vector potential. We have just sigma dot p Hamiltonian. Uh, in the presence of magnetic field, the momentum component along magnetic field remains uh, unaffected. There is no Lorentz force along magnetic field. But uh, the uh, part of the Hamiltonian with momentum perpendicular to magnetic field gets this long derivative shifted by the vector potential. And uh, in order to solve this Hamiltonian, to find its spectrum, we can use the knowledge from graphene business. Okay. So, one thing you have probably heard about graphene is that it has this very special Lando level, the zero Lando level, zero energy Lando level. That's where all the fancy stuff uh, uh, about graphene comes from. And if we just set P is equal to zero, so we're to dealing with a two-dimensional P space now, this is essentially graphene in magnetic field. So, we'll have this zero Lando level at zero energy and then square root, you know, relativistic Lando levels away from it. So, a uh, funny thing happened when we uh, turned on this uh, PZ term. So, if you, again, if you're familiar with graphene business, you know that this looks like a, a PZ-dependent mass term. So, in graphene, you would get this term if you break uh, the symmetry between sublattices. So, this is a PZ uh, mass term, and when you turn it on, the non-zero Lambda levels disperse kind of normally. They stay close to the uh, valley in which they were, they originated. But the zero Lambda levels do something funny. They, they, they become chiral. So the slope of a zero Lando level in a given valley, this is one valley, this is another, is, is of the same sign everywhere. So these electrons are chiral, they go in one direction. So say these electrons go along the magnetic field, the, these electrons go uh, against the magnetic field, okay? So what's you see? The difference? I mean, less than right. Uh, what, what exactly is the difference between these two, two things? So uh, the difference, ah, thank you. The difference is this plus minus in front of the Hamiltonian. So you see that plus minus uh, sigma dot p does not really uh, change the spectrum, of, right? So spectrum is still this relativistic fermion going at the speed of light, you know, the Dirac speed v. 
what what plus minus change, uh, changes is the so-called chirality of this uh, of this uh, node, right? It tells you whether the Hamiltonian, you know, it's a hedgehog in momentum space, whether it points away from the origin or toward the origin. So it's the orientation of this hedgehog that tells you where, where, where the slope is positive or negative. That's that's an important point. Okay. So uh, now. Uh, uh, now that I have uh, the spectrum, let me turn on the electric field and uh, what electric along the magnetic field. And what the electric field does, it accelerates electrons. Okay? So these electrons that used to sit right below the Fermi energy will be accelerated to become above the Fermi energy. This electron, which used to be also right below the Fermi energy, will accelerate to go even deeper. So you see what's going on. This uh, sausage of electrons here is, is pushed up and this, uh, this guy pushed down. So it looks like there are more and more electrons in this valley and there are less and less electrons in this, val in this valley. Of course, there's no magic. This lambda level just goes from van le one valley to the other and connects somewhere deep in the band. So these electrons just flow through the bottom of the band from one valley to another. What is the spin degeneracy? Uh, spin degeneracy here does not exist because we're considering a system with broken time reversal or inversion. So uh, the, the band uh, is not degenerate. So spin is no longer spin, it's a mixture of, you know, spin and orbital degrees of freedom. So your electrons are always in the same handedness, right? Is that what also left and right mean in this case? This is, this is... Uh, and if they're going one way, then the spin is pointing... I mean, uh, okay, so uh, this, is, this is different handedness. So these electrons... Are, are not real electrons. They are, you know, massless electrons now. Okay. So they indeed have their, their handedness uh, of definite sign. Okay. So uh, if you will, handedness, let, let, let's look at the conduction band only. Then this handedness will be opposite for, for this band and this band. And its sign will depend what happens when they turn on magnetic field. So, but it's, you know, plus, minus, then it's plus, minus. So you, you got to pick two of them in order to uh, uh, talk about relative handedness, if you will. Okay, so basically, if you turn on E along B, your electrons will flow from one valley to another. Okay, this is this may some, uh, seem like something not particularly important, but people in graphene are you know killing uh, themselves you know to get this imbalance between uh, between valleys. Okay, and here you get it for free. So a person who suffered enough, this is a big deal, right? <laughs> so. Uh, if you look at the uh, equation for this physics that I described, you'll see that the rate of change of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, n right, there is no uh, reason in which this is right. It's just, you know, one, one value minus the other value. Rate of change of number in this value is proportional with e dot b, turned to the electromagnetic fields, and other than that is just a bunch of uh, fundamental constants in front of it, okay? So that's why it, it's, it's actually a topological phenomenon. It does not depend on anything, only on the configuration of electromagnetic fields that you apply to the system. Okay. So there's saturation, or there's scattering, or what? what yes, there, there is scattering. So we're uh, uh, we're in condensed matter. We're, we're in, in in a crystal. So this this pumping will not last forever. There will be a slow process, either intervalle scattering, or the, these guys will get to the surface and kind of go through the surface to the other valley. Something will stop this pumping. That's going to be important. So uh, you know condensed matter physics, John. You know what the answer is to, right? So. Uh, all right, so this is one part of the story. So the other, the other part of the, uh, that is usually associated with the uh, uh, fanciness of these materials is the so-called chiral magnetic effect, which in a sense is, a, is the opposite effect to chiral anomaly. So chiral anomaly is what? Take magnetic field, take electric field, you will get uh, imbalance between values. Chiral magnetic effect is the opposite of that. Take magnetic field, take imbalance, you will get current. Okay, uh, let's look at this diagram. Very simple to understand. So now imagine that the chemical potentials in one valley and another valley are different, right? So the number of electrons that go up is, say, larger than the number of a number of electrons that go down. There is uncompensating, uncompensated electrons going uh, up. So there is current. Okay. Again, this also comes from this uh, from the existence of the zero slander level. And first person who uh, noticed this in the context of neutrino physics was uh, Vilenkin, Alexander Vilenkin from, you know, from my home uh, town, so uh, I like this. So physically, why, why is there this imbalance? Physically, physically uh, really, uh, practically, it's because of this. So the way to create imbalance between valleys is, is by chiral anomaly. It's, it's, of course, it's very hard 
to create imbalance, uh, imbalances in, my, in uh, momentum space, especially with a probe that, that does not resolve the valley, right? You need to probe that, is, that can resolve the valleys in order to create imbalance between them. That means this probe needs to be very, very sharp. There are no, no such probes, no such probes readily available. But Kyle normally allows you to, to create imbalance between valleys. So this would work only in systems that, that have this chiral in, in, in these systems, it's it's easy to to achieve this. Okay, can yeah, exactly. Else, huh? Can can you? Do I mean, it, I should put some trust in you know uh, experimental ingenuity, maybe. But as I said, in graphene, people people really want to do this, and they try to do this, but then everything is immediately ruined by the boundary or something. Like that. There's always something that doesn't work. But but I think there are actually. Anyways, did you, did you know if? In graphene, they achieve this. So it's it's hard. It's for sure hard. That, that's why that's why people are excited about this. No, the so word exists. Huh? The word exists. Valetronic system. Right, but uh, so the lo to launch a valley dependent current is easier than to create the valley imbalance. So <laughs> valley, valley, no, it's a different valley <laughs> Right. So, anyways, uh, uh, what we did uh, was to propose how to combine this chiral, chiral anomaly and chiral magnetic effect into an experimental setup that will essentially allow to, to measure the, the existence of these two uh, phenomena. So the setup was very, very simple. So you take, uh, you take a film of bile and metal and you use two pairs of, of leads. In, in this pair of lead uh, essentially uh, serves as the valley battery. Okay, uh, so in this in, uh, in this this pair of leads, you turn on magnetic field and you pass current along the magnetic field, which is kind of like uh, turning on the electric field along magnetic field. And what this does, it it uh, biases the two valleys. This, of course, pumping does not last forever. There is intervalley scattering and some other uh, some process that stops this pumping, so you have some dynamic equilibrium where rate of pumping is the same as rate of, you know, scatter. So this biases the two valleys. So now, uh, here in this part of the uh, setup, the following thing happens. So say you have more right electrons than left electrons. So right electrons will diffuse outside of this region. There are too many of them here, so they want to, diffu they want to diffuse out. So there, are, uh, there is a lack of left electrons, so, so they will suck in. So there is actually a valley current created in this, in this region. So there is a chemical potential difference between the two valleys and the valley current flowing toward the other end, toward the other pair of leads. So here, here we turn on magnetic field and turn this uh, potential, turn this potential difference into current, into chiral magnetic effect. And since this is a, a voltmeter, there should be no current through it. So there will be a voltage build up, a regular voltage build up that will, uh, uh, launch uh, regular, you know, uh, this uh, ohmic current to compensate for this current, and this is the voltage that will be measured by this voltmeter. Okay. If you want to reverse the current, what do you do? If you want to reverse the direction of the current, can you do that or not? Uh, sure, sure, right. So uh, you you can. So uh, the 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 direction of this valley current it depends on the you know this E dot B product mm -hmm. here in the, in the battery. So reverse either uh, either one or the other, you will you will change the voltage, and uh, this this uh, this uh, non-local voltage was actually uh, measured by uh, experimental groups in Fudan. So this is a, a log plot of a voltage as a function of the distance between the two. Lead. They actually created like a bunch of leads here and measured uh, locally at at, uh, at you know different uh, positions. There, there was this, uh, they subtracted some spurious so ohmic voltages. That was exactly what, uh, what uh, uh, we expected to see there, with the, say, even, even with the right uh, decay lengths uh, due to interval scattering, a couple of microns. So, you know, this, this was uh, experimentally verified, and that's why I you know, decided to brag about it, basically. In previous history, it was called effect. Mm -hmm. And it was not very effective. But then you could. Uh, mm, wait, wait, wait. Why, why is this? Why is this Hanley effect? But it is. It's exactly the Hanley effect. Ferromagnet creates spin imbalance 
and then it creates a voltage drop in a rather firm And what you're telling about is conductive, but only it's not the spins, but the belts. And what I wanted to ask is that in Hanley physics, people were able to apply magnetic field and study the evolution of this ball. That's what I say. That's, that's not it. So you, you won't see any, any you know, a curve, this Hanley curve, because of the external magnetic field. I that's see. that's, that's just... The magnetic field here is, is a generator yes. of is the imbalance. Any, any parameter that can change to affect this ball. But of course, so uh, this, this voltage is directly proportional to the current that, that, uh, that goes through this contact and magnetic field that you applied. Uh, moreover, uh, it's actually very sensitive to the direction of the magnetic field, right? So you apply it along the current, you will get voltage. Flip it, E dot B is zero, you will get no voltage. But, but the mechanism of it is not, not the coherent of spins. It's, it's, it's completely different. But you have a decay of your value imbalance. That's what the diffusion is all about. So in, in the sense it is analogous, except sure. Handler is a periodic magnetic field dependence, whereas here it's a linear magnetic field dependence. Right? Maybe you guys should explain this to me uh, you know, uh, later on. Okay, so uh, let me uh, then uh, get closer to the uh, topic of the remainder of this talk. And uh, uh, what, what these observations that, you know, chiral, uh, chiral uh, normally uh, exist and chiral magnetic effect exist in these uh, materials led to was the realization that uh, in a crystal, these valleys need not be uh, located at the same energy if they are not related by symmetry, by right? some of crystalline symmetries. So you can have a situation like this where one, one valley is, uh, is higher in energy, the other one is, uh, is lower. And then, even if you draw a common chemical potential for the two valleys, it looks like here, you know, here there are fewer electrons. Here it looks like you counted from the uh, from the wild point. There are more electrons, so maybe even in an equilibrium crystal, we can get this chiral magnetic effect. Okay, so there were a few papers written on this, but then it was quickly realized that uh, no, in equilibrium there is there is no current that is proportional to magnetic field. Okay, there is no such. Uh, uh, current along, along the magnetic field, and uh, yet, yet uh, it was observed that if you take this kind of situation, but apply current at finite frequency, so here you, you apply, uh, sorry, you apply magnetic field at, at exactly zero frequency, the completely static magnetic field, you get zero, but you, if you apply oscillating magnetic field, you get a non-zero result, okay? And, uh, Anton Burkov's group did this uh, for a very strong magnetic field for one particular model, got non-zero result, and somehow decided it was also a manifestation of chiral anomaly. Does the current, does the current get omega not equal to zero? Uh, the current does it occur at all omegas other than zero, or are there certain preferred omegas? So, there is, there is some funny business going on with order of limits here, okay? So, in general, maybe, maybe let, let us postpone this question until, uh, until uh, you know, one uh, slide uh, ahead, because you, you'll, you'll see what's going on there. Uh, so, what we essentially set out to do uh, was uh, to uh, understand what this current really uh, is, okay? So, somehow it was not particularly uh, plausible that it, uh, it is related to chiral anomaly. So, what we decided to do is to study current in a situation like this, you know, with valley uh, points, um, uh, wild points being at different energies for a general band structure, okay? But it actually somehow grown into a uh, much larger story. So, how do you approach this problem? How to calculate a current like that? So, what, uh, what we realized that uh, this uh, so-called dynamic chiral magnetic effect, chiral magnetic effect at finite frequency, was a particular case of natural optical activity, okay? So I need to tell you what natural optical activity is, just in case, because you actually saw Adam uh, doing a demonstration on natural optical activity last week during, uh, uh, during the uh, um, colloquium by Ben, okay? So for a theorist, or a, at least modern perspective uh, on, a, on a natural optical activity is as follows. So first of all, material is optically active, if it responds differently to left and right polarization of light, okay? So, in practice, this is a 
this is an effect of a spatial dispersion of conductivity tensor. So you have a conductivity tensor that depends on frequency and Q in principle. So it has a local part, the optical conductivity. And then in principle, it has a part that is linear in Q. And it is this part that is linear in Q that is responsible for all this natural optical activity business. Okay? So this is a primary interest for us in this talk. So uh, basically, uh, to see what's going on, you can uh, assume that the crystal is isotropic. So this uh, third rank tensor is the Levi Civita tensor, epsilon ABC. Uh, and assume that propagation of the wave happens along Z direction. And then uh, once you turn this conductivity tensor into dielectric tensor, you'll see that this tensor actually is a matrix in the space spanned by EX and EY, uh, field components in uh, XY plane where you know, they actually wiggle for propagation along Z. And the, the eigenstates, the eigenvectors of this tensor, uh, where, uh, of course, this you know, uh, second Pauli matrix piece determines those uh, eigenvectors, essentially one I and one minus I. The two, uh, the two circular polarizations, and the eigenstates, uh, eigen, uh, sorry, eigenvalues uh, are different, so you have different uh, refractive indices for uh, left and right polarized light. Okay, so now let's go back to this chiral magnetic effect. This is how we defined it: response of current to magnetic field. Okay, so at finite frequency, magnetic field can be actually expressed through electric field using the Faraday's law. So you can either view this as something super fancy, uh, uh, current responding to magnetic field, or you can re uh, view this current as, uh, as a response to electric field, but with a response, co a response coefficient that determines linear on Q. So we're back to this term, back to this formula, the conductivity tensor. That immediately tells you how to calculate it. You just need to calculate the spatial dispersion of the conductivity tensor, extract the linear piece, and you're golden. You will get this lambda. Okay? So, to summarize this discussion, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll tell that basically this uh, metal, the uh, lambda tensor in the metal turns out to be proportional to this coefficient in the chiral, dynamic chiral magnetic effect divided by frequency. And really, the only, the only difference between a, an insulator and a metal is what this coefficient does when you send omega to zero. Okay? So, first of all, you always have to do it be, uh, after you send Q to, to zero. So what is the, what exactly is the state of the term? I don't know. So basically, uh, imagine that uh, I, I'm this, you know, uh, theorist that tells you that, look, there is, a, there is a response of current to magnetic field. There is response coefficient associated with that. So that's what I call eta. So, but then, but then uh, you, you tell me that really this is no different from, uh, from natural optical activity and the relation between tensor, this lambda tensor, and this response coefficient is basically this. Okay, so in the metal, this eta essentially goes to, to a finite number uh, when you send Q to zero and then omega to zero. This is the dy dynamic response, transport response. In, a, in an insulator, this, this eta would have, uh, would have gone to omega squared. Yeah, but, but if eta goes to a constant, then as you lower the frequency, omega goes order, order of limit. So there is, there is uh, sending Q to zero, Okay, so screen. So I, I know, I know, I know what you're concerned about, but uh, this this cannot be pushed all the way to zero because there is some relaxation time in reality. So this this really looks like this. Okay, this is essentially some momentum relaxation time. So this is one over omega piece. But once it hits one over tau, it goes back to zero. You left out that right, uh, but you, you'll see it. You'll see it soon. But okay, okay. All right. So now we have placed this dynamic chiral magnetic effect in a much more uh, broader uh, context of condensed matter physics. So we know that we're studying uh, uh, studying uh, 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 a connectivity tensor uh, in metals, and. You, you would think that in the 21st century, that tensor is well studied, okay? Conductivity tensor. Turns out that no, right? So we somehow found a piece in the tensor that has not been essentially uh, looked at in metals and, and built a theory of that, of that piece that I would like to uh, tell you about. So, but let me uh, say a couple of general uh, words about this tensor. So, sigma AB, uh, in principle, depends on omega, Q, and uh, here I introduce dependence on magnetization. 
possibly present in, in your sample, right? Sample can be magnetized or not. And there are fundamental, uh, fundamental symmetries on Zagier symmetry relations that this tensor needs to obey, okay? So basically, the, on Zagier relations tell you that the, the tensor does not change if you invert the sign of Q and the sign of M, okay? So there are two options for, uh, for us. Imagine that we have a, a magnetic material but we do not want to look at spatial, uh, spatial dispersion effects we set Q to zero and expand the tensor to linear order M so this is, this is the conductivity tensor so this third rank uh, tensor ka, uh, ka, chi is what uh, is known as the anomalous hole effect okay? so it's a conductivity tensor that, that depends linearly on the magnetization so it was, uh, this anomalous hole effect was discovered by the same hole as, as regular Hall effect, two years after the regular Hall effect, and it took 70 years, uh, it took people 70 years to figure out what the origin of this anomalous Hall effect was. Okay, it was an order of magnitude stronger than regular Hall effect. For 70 years, people didn't know what was going on. It's longer than it took people to figure out superconductivity. Maybe because fewer people were working on this or something like that, but <laughs> still, it's 70 versus, I don't know, 40, 30, 44. Okay? So, uh, right now, by now, the, the theory of this tensor essentially is well, 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 very well known. It's known that it's a Fermi surface quantity, so in the metal, it's a quantity that's determined by the Fermi surface. Okay, uh, it's known that there are intrinsic uh, mechanisms that contribute to this tensor, uh, that is, mechanisms that come from band structure. There are extrinsic mechanisms that come from impurity scattering that contribute to it. And what we have found that in metal, a very similar story basically happens to natural optical activity, which is the other case. Imagine that I put M equal to zero. I don't want to have a magnetic crystal, but I keep uh, uh, this linear uh, uh, Q vector here. So I expand the linear order. Now my tensor looks like this. This tensor lambda ABC also happens to be um, anti-symmetric with respect to uh, the first pair of indices. It should be not AB, but BA here. Okay, And uh, uh, also you can tell that uh, you need inver broken inversion in order to have non-zero uh, non uh, response like this. The reason is that this is a third rank tensor, so upon inversion it changes sign. Minus sign for every index here, A, B, C. So it changes sign, so if inversion is a symmetry, this tensor is, is guaranteed to be zero, right? So because minus tensor should be the same as tensor, so it's zero. So you need to have broken inversion, but time reversal invariance, and then this is exactly the uh, the uh, conditions for the uh, natural optical activity to uh, uh, arise. It was discovered in, you know, some 70 years before the anomalous Hall effect. Uh, the, there was almost no theoretical work on it uh, for metals. Uh, people, of course, did consider, you know, a natural optical activity in, in molecules and insulators. Metals somehow were not looked at all. It is really the appearance of these wild metals, wild metals that kind of generated interest, uh, theoretical and experimental, to, to this phenomenon in metals. But it turned out that there is a very, very, very similar structure to the, the theory of this tensor uh, to the theory of, of this, you know, anomalous Hall effect. So, and, uh, okay, th this is the right time to brag, right? So we're the only group who, who knows this theory, okay? Right, so, uh, uh, let me now tell you what, uh, what is going on here. So it's just uh, to, to, again, uh, uh, the, to draw home the, the analogy between the two phenomena. So in anomalous Hall effect, uh, anomalous Hall effect is about so-called uh, uh, anomalous, but of course everything is anomalous uh, in anomalous Hall effect. All right, so it's, an, uh, it's about anomalous velocity, again, which has this Barry curvature contribution. Maybe you have heard these words. And then there, is a, there are two impurity contributions to the quantity. So it will turn out that natural optical activity comes not from anomalous velocity, but from this intrinsic orbital magnetic moments of quasi-particles, another uh, interband coherence uh, phenomenon. Uh, and it also has intrinsic and disorder-related contributions, and I will tell you about these contributions now. Okay? First, uh, maybe uh, uh, let me emphasize what was the physical content of this tensor is. So, all this would be would be not important if, if this tensor did not uh, define you know, some important experiment. So first of all, this tensor lambda 
uh, determines the uh, Faraday rotation for the transmitted light to your system. Okay, so if, if this is non zero, you shine light with linear polarization, the light that comes out will have rotated polarization. So it, it has uh, effect on uh, polarization rotation. The second uh, physical effect that it uh, determines is the so-called kinetic magnetoelectric effect. So magnetoelectric effect uh, is a re magnetic response to electric perturbations or vice versa, uh, electric response to magnetic perturbations. Okay? So normally uh, you look at a crystalline equilibrium in which magnetization, say, can respond to electric field. Right? So in a crystalline equilibrium, you immediately see that inversion must be broken and time reversal must be broken. Right? So this is, this is a zeta vector, this is a vector, so inversion is broken, a zeta vector is proportional to vector. This is time reversal odd, this is time reversal even, so inversion, uh, time reversal is also broken. So normally in, in equilibrium crystals, this time reversal breaking is achieved by having some magnetic order. But by this breaking of time reversal can also be achieved by having a dissipative process going on. There is a current flow in the metal. Okay? So this kind of relation, still requires broken inversion. That's exactly what we, what we need to have, you know, while symmetrical in the first place. But also can, can happen if there is some dissipative process going on, if there is a current flow. So if there is a magnetization response to, to electric field in the presence of current flow, uh, that magnetoelectric eff effect is called kinetic. It's associated with, with the flow, okay? So it turns out that this tensor lambda actually determines this uh, kinetic magnetoelectric effect. To see this is very simple. Just you know, write down phenomenological uh, responses for um, polarization, magnetization. So polarization response to electric field. This is everybody. Uh, this is what everybody is used to. But also polarization can respond to B field. Okay, in principle, and the same with magnetization. It can respond to B field, obviously, but also in principle to electric field. So when you take these phenomenological uh, uh, responses and you uh, build the macroscopic current, time dependent, time derivative of polarization plus curl of magnetization, you will see that you, you go back exactly to that current that we wanted uh, and the, uh, the um, response coefficient lambda the tensor is related to this magnetoelectric response tensor. So if you know one, you can actually get the other and vice versa, okay? So this tensor is good. It's, it's a nice tensor. Uh, it actually it determines uh, important experiments, current-induced magnetization, that's what it is and uh, polarization, light, light, uh, polarization of light rotation in crystals. Are so, chi and E and chi E M the same? Uh, uh, they are the same because of Onzaga relations. So Onzaga relations uh, dictate that these, these guys with you know, plus I and minus I yeah. extracted, they turn out to be the same. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, now I come to, uh, to our uh, first uh, work uh, in, in this series, which was done uh, together with Jim. Uh, so, uh, submitted to, you know, published in the PRB with editors of suggestion. We actually submitted it to uh, uh, Fizzer X, and they returned it to us saying that there is not enough relation to wild cell metals or something. So, I, I wrote angry response that, you know, when you and wild cell metals are gone, this will still be around or something. <laughs> you know, good, good luck turning into a tabloid like nature or something like that. And, uh, you know, then PRB was just a wonderful experience, very smooth, you know, editor suggestion, very happy. Okay. Okay, so uh, first I'm going to uh, talk about the intrinsic contribution to these, uh, to these uh, quantities. And uh, as I told you, intrinsic contributions come from dense structure. So uh, uh, I take it not everybody here uh, thinks about uh, dense structures uh, all the time. So let me uh, tell you how to think about them, but you know, this is the shortest solid state course ever. <laughs> so uh, basically what I need you to know is that when uh, electrons propagate through a crystal, they essentially go as plane waves, okay? They do not bounce off every ion. I mean, this is, you know, solid state, one ohm minus one kind of information. So they look like uh, plane waves, but they're modulated plane waves. Okay, there is this plane wave piece, and then there's a periodic part that modulates that plane wave. That's the difference between crystal and free space. Okay, and it is this this periodic part, the modulating modulating part, that is of importance to us. Okay, so you can write Schrodinger equation basically for for the full state, for the full block wave here, or you can write Schrodinger equation for the periodic part. For you, if you if you use this uh, so-called Bloch Hamiltonian, this rotated uh, rotated lattice Hamiltonian. 
Okay, so uh, what you have out of this exercise is the band structure, the collection of bands in a crystal for a given uh, wave vector and associated wave functions. Okay, it is these periodic parts of the wave functions, as I said, that are important to us. So I should also mention that this K is really not a uh, wave number, it's a quasi-wave number. It lives in the brilliant zone, not the entire uh, K space, not the entire momentum space, but in, in the finite chunk of it, in the brilliant space. And that uh, brilliant zone and brilliant zone is really topologically a torus, but this is irrelevant for the present discussion. Okay? So now I, I, I put the word geometric in the title of this talk. So it's time to, to discuss where this geometry uh, is coming from. Right, so geometry is coming from the uh, existence of so-called Berry phases in, in the momentum space. It actually is true for any parameter space in which your wave function lives, but here the parameter space, what wave function depends on, is the momentum space. Okay, so it turns out that in general, if this u of k depends on k, and you drag it through the uh, momentum space, it will accumulate a phase. Okay, in particular, if you start if you start at a particular point in a magnetic field, a momentum space, and drag it along the closed loop, there will be a net phase accumulated, and that tells you that the, the space in which uh, in which this uh, uh, wave function lives is curved. This is the same as uh, you know uh, the famous example of uh, curvature of, of a sphere, right? If you if you um, uh, do parallel transport in a sphere along a closed loop, your your you know, uh, the, uh, the little ant that does the parallel transport will rotate. If, if you have seen that illustration, it will help, but if you don't have it. That's the only yeah. thing that happens to you when it moves from K to K prime? So... It's got to be changing all the way. So, uh, this, the, the important part is that it's an adiabatic evolution, right? So, I am not allowing any transition, any real transition. No, but it's the, 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 the shape of the function U is going to change from KI to KF. It's going to be different. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So, and uh, the phase is going to change. That, that's right. So, uh, exactly. But what, what I mean is that once you go along a closed loop, whatever happened to the shape, you got back to the original right. point. So, it turns out that shape went back to what it was, right. but there is an extra phase. Okay. And this, uh, that extra phase is impossible to get rid of with any kind of, you know, uh, unitary transformation or anything like that. Okay? Yeah. Right? So, it is the existence of this phase, or which is analogous to rotation of a vector upon a parallel transport in a sphere, that essentially um, uh, gives a geometry to this space. The connectivity of the wave functions, of these wave functions, in the momentum space is where geometry is coming from. Okay? So, this is the shortest uh, course on differential geometry. So, I should say that basically you can, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, define what's, what's called the Berry connection. This is very much analogous to the electromagnetic connection, electromagnetic vector potential in, uh, in electrodynamics. And then uh, the phase that is accumulated along a closed path will be the flux of the Berry curvature, that is the magnetic field that's associated with this connection through that, through that loop, just like there is magnetic flux associated with a closed loop in real space for ma real magnetic fields. So, Okay, so the, the important thing about this uh, Berry phase business is that uh, these, uh, these Berry connection and Berry curvature affect dynamics of particles, okay? So the reason to, uh, uh, the, the, the way to see that is to look at the operator of the position, uh, which turns out to be, uh, to have this usual d by dk piece, the one that you would expect from free space, but also this, you know, uh, correction there is nothing but the Berry, uh, Berry connection. So when you accelerate your particle, when k changes in time, then this a also changes in time. That means that your, your electron is shifting around in the u unit cell. This has the meaning of the position within the unit cell. Okay? So Berry phases and Berry connection affect dynamics of particles. Okay? So in particular, it leads to the appearance of this anomalous velocity. So here is the expression for the velocity, r dot. This is the usual band velocity, and the, this is the anomalous velocity, uh, p dot, with the force that acts on the particle crossed with the Berry curvature. So this, is, this really is the origin of intrinsic contribution to the uh, anomalous Hall effect. Really, for us, it, it has no, uh, no value. Okay? So finally, I can tell you where things uh, are coming from in our business. So, uh, it turns out that this uh, intrinsic contribution to uh, natural optical activity in crystals is rooted in this uh, semi-classical correction, so-called semi-classical corrections to kinetics, 
but they come not from the anomalous velocity as anomalous whole effect, but they come from so-called orbital magnetic moment of quasi-particles. So let me explain where this comes from. So imagine uh, I am building a wave packet uh, in, in a given band. That means that I used a reduced set of wave functions to build that wave packet, which means that this wave packet cannot be arbitrarily small. In order to, to build a wave packet that is, that is super, super tight, I need the full, full basis, full wave functions. Okay? Here, I am restricting the dynamics to a single band, so I don't have all the wave functions available. I have only part of them. So my wave, function, uh, my, my wave packet will have a finite size. Anything that has a finite size can, can be assigned a self-rotation. Okay? It can propagate and rotate. And it's meaning, meaningful because it, it has finite size. Okay? It's a chunk of something. So it turns out that in general, when there is very curvature in the uh, band structure, there is actually a magnetic moment associated with, uh, with quasi-particles. They fly, and then they rotate. So look what <coughs> the effect of this magnetic moment is on the properties of this uh, quasi-particle in the magnetic, uh, magnetic field. So first of all, the energy is changed from the old band energy to the, this, you know, by this effective Zeeman term, right? Magnetic moment times B minus mu B that you know from elementary physics. <coughs> but since this M depends on P, this, this energy change actually is P dependent. So you change velocity of the particle. Right? Velocity is the derivative of energy with respect to momentum. So this energy changes the velocity expectation. Okay? Also, there is another source uh, of corrections. Basically, magnetic, uh, magnetic moments, when they have finite density, lead to magnetization. Excuse me. And non-uniform magnetization leads to currents, coil of magnetization kind of currents. So when there is a non-uniform density of these amps, there is actually a, a current flowing in the system. This is another way... Uh, this is the, another way uh, they lead to, uh, to a current. And then, basically, you put everything together. You put everything together <laughs> very carefully. OK, something is wrong. Or, adiabatically, I'm doing everything very adiabatically. Right. OK. And, uh, uh, let, let me uh, skip the, the, these derivations a bit. And what you get is the lambda tensor, the expression for the lambda tensor that includes these uh, magnetic moments. So I do not expect you to, uh, expect you to read this, uh, but uh, what I would like to emphasize is that uh, this lambda tensor, I'm expressing it through a dual, uh, dual second drag tensor, basically depends only on the, the, on, on the magnetic uh, moments of the quasi-particles and essentially derivatives of the equilibrium distribution function. So this tells you that it's a Fermi surface phenomenon. It's, it's, st it's stuck to the Fermi surface because that's where this derivative is non-zero. And then it only knows about the magnetic uh, moments of these quasi-particles. So if you spin orbit you can express anomalous whole effect through the constant in this Hamilton. Can you ex express this quantity also through this constant? Uh, ah, so will, will this magnetic moment be somehow proportional to the very curvature, related. for example? No, no, they, no, they are related, but not so they are related. They are exactly uh, you know related for for two band system. We have only two bands relevant. Okay. Then one can be expressed with the other. For a general band structure, no, they are independent. No, but, but not completely unrelated. No, not, com no, no not completely okay. unrelated. Yes. Okay. So. Now I'd like to uh, go to the e extrinsic effect, and especially given the, the time I have left, uh, I, will, I will follow the following path. So in principle, uh, at this point, I should take you to the wonderful world of quantum kinetic equations. This is a difficult uh, business. But uh, the older I get, the more I realize that not everybody wants to be in that world, OK? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> what, I will, what I will do, what I will do, I will, I will basically provide you a physical picture of what's going on. And then uh, I will just keep enough equations on this, on this, uh, on this slide that if you, if you care, you will be able to redirive the results on this spot. Okay, so get down to work if you're interested. Right, so 
The intrinsic, uh, intrinsic corrections to, uh, to these uh, effects come from uh, two kinds of uh, interactions of electrons with impurities. Uh, electrons scatter from impurities in crystals, of course. So what they do are you know, a couple of things. First of all, something you're not used uh, uh, in uh, textbook quantum mechanics, they shift upon scattering. So what do I mean by that? So normally, when, when, people, when people draw scattering, they, so they, come, you know, they, they draw incoming plane wave and then some sort of spherical wave coming out of it, the center of spherical wave being at the impurity. This thing in the crystal basically gets shifted. Remember, the position, uh, the position of, the, uh, of the particle includes that barrier connection, which depends on K or momentum. If momentum gets a sudden, sudden change, the position of the electron in the uh, unit cell gets a sudden change. Okay? receives a sudden change. So they, they shift. Right? This is one thing they do. Another thing is the, the so-called skew scattering. The illustration is the simplest in free space, where electrons, uh, when they scatter from a spin orbit coupled impurity, electrons, say, will spin up, go predominantly to the left. Electrons will spin down, go predominantly to the right. Okay, skew scattering. Okay? They do the same in crystals, except <coughs> spin orbit usually comes from the crystallized structure, not from the impurity. Okay, so let me let me tell you where things come uh, from in this in this business. So first, let's deal with skew scattering, and I will I will illustrate this skew scattering with the example of, of tellurium. So basically, uh, tellurium is a crystal which has a hexagonal hexagonal lattice of uh, of you know DNA molecules made out of tellurium atoms. Okay, so they're like this. And these, you know, um, helices, they're stuck uh, in, uh, in hexagonal lattice. Okay? So that's the lure. So, uh, basically what I'm trying to say is the following. That in free space, in free space, this Q scattering, the direction in which this little ball uh, moves, uh, deter is determined by the spin of the ball. Right? Because spin orbit is essentially a spin-dependent potential that is felt by this, by this little blue thing. Okay? So we're dealing with a, with a crystal in which inversion is broken, so the, you know, spin, the, the old band structure is split. There is no notion of spin anymore, so to speak. Okay? But what I would like to notice is that if you go along the helix, essentially, for an electron, it looks like this, right? It, as it goes, well, along the helix, right? So in principle, there is, there is magnetic movement associated with motion along the helix. If you go up, you kind of rotate like this. If you go down, you rotate in the opposite way. So it is this orbital moment uh, of electron that goes along helix that plays the role of spin in this, in this kind of scattering. So what, what happens is that in this type of uh, crystals, electrons that go along the, the growth axis, along the z-axis, scatter from impurities to the left, and electrons that go down scatter to the right. Okay? And this skew scattering, skew scattering leads uh, to, uh, to, to essentially Uh, how about spin in all of this? It seems like you're neglecting the effects of spin. Uh, I'm not neglecting it. It's, it's around. Uh, the one thing I should probably mention is that, and in the meantime, we kind of skip to the next slide so you don't notice. Uh, basically, uh, mostly I'm, I'm concerned here with orbital effects, with okay. effects associated with this. And the reason is that when these effects are, are present, they are much larger than the spin effect. The spin effects, and the reason for that is the uh, largeness of the um, Bohr's magneton for 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 the for orbital motion. So the effective mass in a crystal is much smaller than the bare electron mass. It, it's typically you know one tenth of bare electron mass. So when you when you take spin and convert it into magnetic moment. Usually, orbital effects are, you know, one, five, one order of magnitude uh, stronger than spin effects. Okay? So, uh, basically, now let's, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's understand the physics of the skew scatter contribution. So, what is, what is really scattering from impurity? You come in with a given velocity, and then you take a sharp turn, and you come out with a, with a different velocity, right? So, what happened is that the electron accelerated during this, you know, scattering event. So what I will do, I will take the difference between the you know, initial velocity and final velocity. This is the initial velocity P prime, final velocity P. I will multiply it by the rate of transition from one state to another. 
and sum over all initial states. What I got, I calculate some sort of effective acceleration that is felt by, by my electron upon scattering, right? Change of velocity times the rate at which this change occurs is acceleration, okay? So, which means my electron scatters from periods, accelerates you know, sideways or in some other direction. So, now what I will do, I will multi, and, and then, sorry, this acceleration is stopped by regular scattering, right? So, it tries to accelerate in that direction, but then it hits another impurity and kind of gets de decelerated, okay? So, the, the dynamic equilibrium between these two pro uh, processes leads to appearance of net shift of the electron, right? So, I will take acceleration, multiply it by, by, by the square of the scattering time, I will get shift of, the, my, of my electrons. Right? I will take a cross product of the shift with the speed, I will get magnetic moment associated with this scattering. Okay? Magnetic moment is R cross V. So take this Q scattering related shift, multiply it by the cross it with the velocity, you get magnetic moment. And it turns out that there is this magnetic moment that comes from Q scattering makes exactly the same, no, in form, makes exactly the same contribution to the uh, lambda tensor as the intrinsic contribution. Okay? So, unfortunately, we did not start from this point. We went through all these kinetic equation calculations, and then magically, when you start, you know, finishing up calculation, you start expressing this G tensor, everything collapses to this form, exactly the same as in, in, in intrinsic case, with this kind of effective magnetic moment. Then, of course, you start scratching your head and then trying to, to understand where this is coming from, and then it turns out there is a very simple physical picture associated with it. So, of course, in, in, a, in a talk, you pretend that you started from here and then, you know, confirmed your beautiful insight with calculations, but no. Okay? So, skew scattering makes a contribution to this effective magnetic moment. This, by the way, this skew scattering uh, uh, contribution, as far as I know, uh, was not known in the literature. We sort of found it. Okay? So, of course, the intrinsic part was very well known to people. This is not. So, side jump, essentially, uh, uh, follow similar logic. So let me just tell you that uh, my uh, my electron gets shifted, so I will play the same game. So uh, electron gets shifted during the collision, so I, I will take the absolute, uh, the, I will take the shift multiplied by the rate of, of shifting. I will get velocity, right? Shift times the rate at which it happens is the velocity. Let me go to the next slide. Right, velocity, which, which look like this. So this is the shift multiplied by the rate. You will get some effective velocity. Multiply velocity by the relaxation time, you will get net shift, okay? And then cross this net shift with the uh, bare value of the band velocity, you will get magnetic moment. And if you go through this, this is, the, the good thing about this area is that if you know what's going on, you will get the results more or less easily if you're an, an outsider never you will get anything. So you, you feel protected from, you know, from competition, right? From some, you know, kid with a big computer who can do everything. Nope. Right? So you go through all this mess and, and you get, and you get essentially exactly the same structure of a contribution uh, to the uh, lambda tensor, but with magnetic, magnetic moment that comes from this side jump accumulation uh, uh, process. So, and basically this, this finishes uh, the uh, building of the full theory of this tensor, essentially, we, I think we have the total, the full theory, there is nothing else to be added, in which, you know, there are intrinsic skew scattering and side jump contributions uh, to it. And uh, let me just finish this part saying that uh, in clean crystals, it is really skew scattering contribution that is proportional to the square of the mean path that dominates the effect, okay? But in, in tellurium, with realistic mobility, it, it's actually the intrinsic one that is, that is larger. And so the side jump is always the smallest one, okay? So we, we know the uh, magnitudes and everything else there is to know about these effects. So I will, I will uh, skip the illustration of this formalism for, for crystals. I will just tell you that uh, we also did work on how to measure these things. So Numbers-wise, the rotatory power, so how much you, you get polarization rotated per, per unit uh, path inside a crystal, turns out to be 10 to the minus 2 right per, per millimeter. That's actually very, very comparable to uh, uh, quartz, alpha quartz, where it was actually discovered by Argo, the sand, silicon O2, whatever. 
Okay, so uh, you know we're talking about metals. So for these metals, the skin skin layer depth is roughly a uh, roughly a hundred uh, nanometers. So if you have a film of that depth, you will get uh, a micro rad of rotation, which is easily measurable uh, these days. Okay, so uh, and just just a brief uh, mention of this work. Uh, one thing that uh, you notice is that this effect, once it's there, it's kind of boring actually. So if you have a, a current that has this uh, regular, uh, you know, optical conductivity contribution and the, the dynamic magnetic effect one, the angular rotation depends only on this factor gamma. It does not care what happens inside. Okay, it does not care about the background epsilon of the material. So which is which is unfortunate because you know uh, there is just not much going on. It turns out that if you uh, take a sample with microscopic disorder, so imagine that sample has lots of grains which are uniform inside, but somehow stuck inside uh, inside your in, inside your uh, material, uh, this this uh, uh, rotation angle will have a strong features, relatively strong features at the plasma frequency of this metal. So in a disordered sample, in a disordered sample, this becomes a sort of a more fun signal. It has sharp peaks at the plasma uh, at the plasma edge. Okay. So uh, I should have said that this was done again with Jing and published in PRL. Okay, so these are conclusions. Of course, uh, given the nature of the talk, I also prepared to talk about current work and uh, future work. So maybe I, I will leave it at the at the level that you know there is current work, there will be future work. <laughs> but but uh, what is going on? Uh, what I really wanted to, I guess, promise to you guys is that I am becoming a little bit tired of this wild metal business. I think, you know, the main contributions or what we could have done, we did. So uh, I intend uh, to switch to uh, other areas of uh, physics. And uh, this, this is the current work, so we're applying this, of course, to, we're, we're still finishing up this work. We'll, we'll do it, we're doing some uh, sound absorption in them, but, and uh, strong interaction physics with uh, Oleg's group and uh, with uh, Hassan. Where is Hassan? Oh, okay, you're here. I was about like, where is Hassan? <laughs> okay, so, but uh, really in the future, I would like to kind of go more into the strong, uh, strong correlation physics. And uh, believe it or not, there are still regimes of, uh, of you know, in, in the helium-3 and, and helium-4, which are not understood, uh, particularly so-called semi-quantum liquids. We, and there are wonderful connections to uh, Bose-Hubbard and Fermi-Hubbard models. So I want to go in that direction. I want to uh, get some uh, computational experience. So Junate kind of was teaching us how to do things on the computer. I want to do sort of hardcore computational expertise, no, not hardcore probably won't code much myself, but I, I learned how to run other people's code on, on Linux, which is a major accomplishment. Uh, okay, and uh, in, in another the, uh, direction in which uh, I want to go is the uh, exploration of machine learning uh, applications in, in physics. As I told you, Milo Marzin was the uh, RU student in the department this summer. Uh, we applied this essentially to transverse field Ising model. I think it was very cute. He got, I think, second prize or something like that at the symposium. So then it went really well. Uh, I think this is, you know, this is the future. So uh, I intend to go uh, more in this direction uh, too. So with this, thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Please, Charlie. Hi, I was a uh, <coughs> article for the system. Somewhat disturbed by the potential violation of CPT. Okay. Um, you're showing us that there are obvious uh, T violations, but everything you've shown me seems to be CP invariant, unless you're telling me that the crystal does not have P symmetry. So my crystals definitely don't have P symmetry. That was the whole point. Okay. Uh, but uh, what's charge conjugation here? Well, so, like, uh, trust me, CPT is not violated, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, th th this I can guarantee you. So, in other words, your T, your, your T violation comes directly from CP violation, the P violation of your crystal. No. No. Sorry. No. Let me kill this thing. All right. So, where is it coming from? So, uh, 
uh, again, uh, I'm a condensed metal theorist, right? Let's keep that in mind. So for me, uh, that time reversal breaking comes from, com for, for me, the uh, under underlying uh, equations uh, uh, of na nature are T invariant. Mm -hmm. It's really the presence of magnetization that makes the, the, the world for the rest of the crystal look T, you know, T broken. You see what I'm saying? So if there is magnetization in the crystal, the world in which electrons live has broken T. But of course, the bigger world in which both magnetization and electrons live does not have broken T, right? If I, if I invert uh, the mo direction of motion of electrons and magnetization, T is there. Okay, so you're, you're treating the magnet, like, okay, you're treating so, magnetization as background. And that's right, okay. that's right. Question? Misha was first. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. How are you? <laughs> uh, so this case, when we were discussing the intrinsic effect on those uh, the finite size quasi particles uh, with the magnetic moments, uh, do those also have charge associated to them? Yes, for sure. Yes. Oh, right. Okay. This um, is actually guaranteed by gauge invariance, so electrons do not do not lose charge. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do they have any interesting kind of uh, I guess um, I guess in this case you're doing a three D uh, system, right? So you're talking about braiding? You want right, to braid yeah, them? Yeah, no, not here. So this is not this is not the situation in which there is any, any interest in braiding. And in, in three dimensions to, to, to braid things is is not particularly well defined anyway. Right. right. So th this is not really the, the place okay. to, to ask about that. Um, also what would happen if you take one of these quasi particles and bring them to the boundary, you know, what uh, Imagine a finite size. Uh, right, right. So actually, actually, this is a, uh, an important question. So in these uh, wireless metals, I told you they were topological systems. So it turns out that uh, they, they do what other topological systems do. They have these uh, uh, surface states which know about the bulk topology. So uh, which makes uh, and these these surface states they look a little bit funny. So uh, basically, uh, if you're in two dimensions where you seem to like to be, right? Uh, <laughs> All, all thermal surfaces need to be, you know, closed. They either are closed or they start and end at the boundary of a, of a uh, brilliant zone. So what these guys do, they take the two-dimensional uh, thermal surface, they break it apart into two pieces, and put two two halves at the opposite sides of the of the of the sample. This is, you know, to have this Fermi arc of a Fermi surface is is impossible in two D. But these guys cheat that rule by breaking it apart and placing it on a boundary of a three-dimensional system. That actually leads to some funny uh, funny dynamics of quasi-particles, because if you have a surface like this, and say you have a magnetic field perpendicular to, uh, yes, perpendicular to the surface, uh, this chiral, chiral electron, remember that those zero land, it will go to the surface, then go into this um, uh, Fermi arc surface state, go along the surface, then actually Sink into the into the other uh, uh, node and then go back to this one. Okay, so look what happened. I just draw, I just draw a closed trajectory. So normally, uh, th this basically this is a trajectory in magnetic field, closed trajectory in magnetic field, which kinda is not is not perpendicular to magnetic field. So you will get magnetic oscillations from orbits that normally do not exist in in, in three-dimensional metals. So that, that's what makes, in particular, that's what makes them different from regular metals. They have these weird orbits in both magnetic, it, it's actually very hard to think about that. In this orbit is in both in, mag, in real space and in momentum space. So this is the, not at all what it looks like, right? But funny things happen at the surface, okay? Surface do uh, what Haldane calls, uh, you know, Fermi surface plumbing, they kind of, Connect, connect the valleys, like this. Mish. Suppose we talk about tellurium. Okay. And suppose we don't bother. Suppose electronic spectra is very simple. We keep forget about the effect. Will the vibration phonon structure of tellurium induce uh, rotation of? Uh, Oh, we talked about this, and, and you know that probably yes. Really? I think so. Yeah, it, 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 for sure, for sure, inertial, inertial effects for sure will do that, right? So imagine I take my tellurium and shake it along along the z-axis. It's you know, some of super long uh, long wavelengths uh, limit of a phonon, right? So clearly, th this shaking will will inertial uh, like Stuart Stuart Tolman effect, right? It'll make this electron go 
up and down the, the helix, which will make it do this. So there, there is coupling like that, uh, but but it's a weak, it's an inertial effect, so it's a very weak effect. Yeah. If there are stronger ones from deformation potential, there should so, be. So I can think about uh, phonons only, and then through deformation potential, yes, uh, calculate the impact on uh, polarization on Faraday to this uh, optical activity. Yeah, sure. Need another question. Need another question that will last 15 minutes so that it be safe to leave the campus because the football game will start. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So if you go back to the, a lot of the early slides where the nature papers had issues on it. Do you want me to literally go back to this? Like, yeah, okay. It shows, it shows, <laughs> no, I don't yeah, mind. It's just. If, if, we're, if we're spending time on it, then basically um, it showed a diffusion of your Valley electrons. And I'm, I'm curious in uh, terms. Wait, wait, let, 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 let me find the slide and then you will describe yeah, it. You, you don't need this. There is no that, nature. That, oh, yes, there is nature. That's the slide, yeah. Okay. And I'm just, I'm just asking, what is the speed of that diffusion in real terms, microns per second or whatever? What is the speed at which these elect electrodes communicate to each other? Because if I had a third a pair of electrodes, I could build a gated transistor. And I'm wondering whether it could work comparable to regular transistors. So uh, the speed. Do you want to have diffusion constant, or? I just want to know when they did this measurement, how soon they registered the signal on the second versus turning on the voltage on the first. Uh, I, I can. Uh, I'm sure I can convert this figure into that. So let, let me just. So time is. Uh, uh, what L squared divided by the diffusion constant. Oh, I don't know. But but you know I I can I can do this from diffusion equation. So, what's the diffusion of the No, no. <laughs> right? Sorry. Uh, actually, sorry. Right. So, tau is, is a picosecond. Fermi, Fermi wavelength, Fermi velocity is 10 to the 6 meters per second. So multiply things. I, I'm stressed out. I'm giving a talk. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last question. Sure. Uh, just on that slide, since you brought up the heat, since you brought it back up. Okay. Um, the Fermi wavelength is the same as the Fermi wavelength that you're going to have with your electrons. Uh, how do I know? Where else would I? Uh, I know because there's nowhere else to go. So, the, uh, so this this is a closed system. So in this direction, it's the closed system. There, there is no way to have electric current in this direction. There can be only valley current, which don't carry uh, electric charge. Is that, is that it? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Let's see. <laughs>